We're here today to answer your questions about fair use. One of the best and the worst things about fair use is its flexibility. It doesn't lend itself to easy answers in the abstract. So the questions we answer today are fairly general, and all we can provide is general guidance. You shouldn't take this as legal advice. We're lawyers, but we're not here to give you legal advice today. We can't tell you what you can and can't do in any specific circumstance. So take today's discussion as general guidance, things to consider. And if you have specific questions about content and you're concerned about its legality, consult a lawyer, including us. So what is fair use? If you think about copyright as a series of restrictions, fair use is a set of exceptions. It protects your right to use copyrighted material in certain ways. And it's not a trivial little technicality. It's a fundamental part of the copyright bargain. We don't give copyright owners unlimited control over their content. We preserve a whole variety of uses and things that people get to do with copyrighted content without permission. And fair use is really above all else, a set of factors and considerations that help us figure out which things we carve out of the copyright monopoly and which things we let people do without permission. Okay, let's go through the basics. As I said, fair use is flexible and that's because it really turns on four factors that get considered together. The first question fair use asks is, what are you doing with the copyrighted content? What is the nature of the use you're making? And above all, the most important consideration in that first factor is whether you're doing something transformative. What does transformative mean? It really means, are you saying something new? Are you saying something different than the author of the original work you're borrowing from was trying to say? The second factor examines the nature of the material you're using. If you're using fictional material or highly creative material, then all things being equal, you're gonna have a little less room under the fair use analysis. If you're using something that is less creative, factual, or non-fictional, all things being the same, you're going to have a little more room to use it under the fair use analysis. The third factor in the fair use analysis looks at the amount you used from the original. It's not strictly the number of seconds or on a percentage basis. The real question is whether the amount you used is reasonable in relation to the purpose for which you used it. So the third factor is really going to vary based on the first. There are some purposes where you may need a fairly large amount of material from the original. Maybe there are other purposes where you need less. So the third factor asks, is the amount you borrowed reasonable in relation to the purpose for which you borrowed it? The fourth fair use factor examines the impact of your use on the market for the original. First question is, will your use substitute for the original? Will it reduce the sales, reduce the market for original copies of the copyrighted work? Or for that matter, even if it's not a substitute, is it going to occupy markets that the copyright owner is entitled to exploit? Things like markets for sequels or other derivative works that we reserve to the copyright owner. So to answer any fair use question, you have to look at all four of these factors and figure out how they balance out and weigh out together. There's not a single one that controls. Transformation is the most important, but they all have to be weighed together to get to an answer. Now there's one consideration I want to emphasize separate and apart from the fair use analysis. And that is the question of whether you'll be pursued or for that matter, sued. Keep in mind that it doesn't necessarily matter whether your use is protected or not. Somebody can still sue you. In fact, you may have an unquestionably protected use. Somebody might sue you anyway. Or for that matter, you might have a clearly unprotected use and maybe no one will choose to pursue it. So you always have to remember that the question of whether fair use protects something or not is separate and different from the question of whether somebody might sue you for it and force you to prove up your right to do what you've done. I'm here to talk about some common myths regarding fair use. And one of the common beliefs about fair use is that if you are making money or attempting to make money by uh, using something that that is not a fair use or if you're not making f money off of it Then it automatically is a fair use. This isn't a true distinction While whether something is commercial or non-commercial is one of the factors that goes into deciding Whether a use is fair or not. It is not a determinative factor So you can be doing something to make money whether it's um, off of ad revenue or otherwise That can be a fair use and many commercial enterprises rely on fair use every day. There are other uh, uses that are non-commercial that are not fair use and 
Um, so the distinction between making money or not making money does not uh, decide the question of whether a use is fair or not. Another common myth that people believe is that if you give credit to the original author, then you aren't liable for copyright infringement, or that giving credit is necessary to insulate you from a liability. The law doesn't require that you give credit when you are using another person's work, but it is often advised to give credit where you, where you can. I am at an event, restaurant, or other public place, and a band or the radio is playing in the background, but I do not intentionally record the band or radio. I am filming something else. The music is out of my control. Is this fair use? Yes. Often when you capture copyrighted material incidental to your uh, videoing or recording of another scene or event, the copyrighted material that you capture is a fair use. So when you are at a restaurant or filming a family wedding, for example, and you capture some copyrighted song in the background, the use of that song is uh, often considered a fair use. Obviously, the context and the amount of the use, um, there are other factors that go into each precise decision, but incidental use of copyrighted material in the background is considered a fair use. A movie was filmed in my city a few years ago. I want to film some of the filming location to show people where each scene was filmed. I want to place small clips of the movie side by side with my video. Is this fair use? Yes, the use of movie clips in this example could be a fair use, and it depends on the precise uh, amount of the movie clips that you're using and the way that they're used. But from the description, using movie clips as a reference to compare from the reality of the scene on the street to the scenes in the movie could be considered a fair use. If I keep my video clip under a certain number of seconds, am I in the clear? Fair use doesn't dictate a precise number of seconds that you can or can't use, and each situation is different. The fair use doctrine provides enough flexibility to be able to use a different amount of material depending on your purpose. So the rule that you really need to keep in mind is that the amount you use has to be reasonably related to the purpose for which you're using, but there aren't any bright line rules about how many seconds is fair use and how many aren't. Does a parody video fall under fair use when the visuals are almost entirely from a non-original source, cartoon, gameplay, but it is completely rewritten and revoiced in a humorous manner? Parodies receive relatively strong protection under fair use. One of the reasons is because a parody is fundamentally a criticism of the original. And cases right up to the Supreme Court have provided relatively strong and broad protection for parodies. But you have to be careful about what a parody is. People use the term loosely. They try to use it as a, um, a magic shield to protect a use, and you have to be precise. A parody is something that holds the original up to ridicule. You have to be saying something about the original, presumably something negative or at least critical about the original. By definition, if you are parodying a visual work, you are probably going to use a portion of that visual work. So to answer your question, yes, if you're parodying uh, an audiovisual work, then sure, uh, all things being equal, fair use will probably give you a fair amount of leeway to use the material from that work. Remember, a parody doesn't have to be funny. It doesn't have to be successful. Um, it may not even make any sense, but it has to target the original with some form of critique or ridicule. So to get back to your question, if the subject of your parody is a cartoon or a video game, then presumably you're going to have to use um, a fair amount of that cartoon or that video game to make your parody. So yes, in general, fair use will probably give you a relatively broad latitude to borrow from the original there. Parody is highly transformative. Um, you have to be careful about not going overboard and not using much more than you need in relation to the purpose you're using it, that is the critique, the parody, the ridicule. And it depends whether you're doing it for money or not, but uh, again, doing it for profit is not fatal, and parody tends to fare pretty well under the fair use analysis. If I dub over an episode of a cartoon with my own voices and change the dialogue for parody's sake, am I legally in the clear? So that is a highly transformative use, 
But again, you have to be careful about whether it's a parody or not. Simply changing the dialogue and overdubbing it doesn't necessarily make it a parody. It really depends on whether you're doing that to critique or ridicule the original. But if you are, then yes, fair use is going to provide you pretty broad latitude, provided that the other factors line up the right way. Um, factor two, you'll probably have leeway even if it's a fairly creative or fictional work. Um, the key is the third factor, don't go overboard. Don't borrow more than is reasonable to uh, make the statement you want to make or the critique you want to make. And the fourth factor tends to work out pretty well when it comes to parody because the answer most courts give is we don't let the copyright owner monopolize the market for critique. So if you're truly parodying and ridiculing the original and you don't go overboard with the amount you use, then you're probably going to be in pretty good shape. Can one claim fair use preemptively when posting content to avoid takedowns? Also, what non-court options are there for resolving a copyright fair use dispute? Well, uh, you could lay out your fair use position preemptively. Will it avoid a takedown? Not necessarily. No way to guarantee that. Uh, that's really up to the copyright owner. But once you receive that takedown, yeah, there's an opportunity to open a dialogue with the copyright owner who's name and address you'll presumably have uh, with, with the takedown in hand. So what, what, what's important to remember is that you know, these are people on the other side of the permission question, and it is possible that you can reach out to the folks who own the content, explain why you're using it, um, why you think it's fair, why you think it's legal, and it's possible they'd see it your way. So it does present an opportunity to talk and work it out. If that doesn't work, you can counter notice, at which point the copyright owner has to either sue you, or if he doesn't sue you, then the content goes back up. If I am uploading YouTube videos of captured video and commentary of video games as I play them, am I violating copyright? Well, that's an interesting one, because for years and years, there has been just a ton, a ton of activity where people play a video game and attach all sorts of commentary and put them up on YouTube. There, for a long, long time, people were doing that with Halo. In fact, people made, uh, I think, a whole series um, that where they played Halo to manipulate the characters um, almost as, as if they were on stage. And they added the dialogue and, and, and made a drama out of the gameplay that shows up on the screen. Uh, probably pretty transformative. That's quite different than the purpose for which the game was created. I think it was created to destroy things. I'm not sure. But you're doing something very different than um, Bungie was doing when it made Halo. You're saying something new. Presumably, this is not for profit. Uh, is it fictional? Is it creative? Hard to say. Hard to say um, in that case. And the third factor even goes haywire because, you know, what is the whole work? You know, the video game could go on for 50 hours before you finish it. But most fundamentally, I think very few people would say, that you are harming the market for the original in any plausible way by doing this, especially if it's posted for fun on YouTube or other sites on a nonprofit basis. Uh, and you can take some comfort in uh, looking at whether other people have done this, have been pursued or not. So this is probably one of those questions that ends up in a gray area, no clear yes, no clear no. But uh, this sort of thing has been done and done widely without much repercussion on YouTube. And so, again, going back to the question, uh, is it legal or not? Hard to say, no easy answer, but it's also the sort of thing that, for the most part, copyright owners have left alone, probably because, at the end of the day, it helps sales of the video game. If I do a parody of a song, can I use the same music, exactly like the original, as long as I or a music composer recreate it from scratch? Or does it have to actually sound a bit different, like Conan's version of It's Friday did? No, there's, there's a fair amount of latitude to use the actual music. In fact, one of the most famous fair use cases is one that went up to the Supreme Court when the Two Live crew did its own version of Roy Orbison's Pretty Woman. And in that case, the court found it was a parody. It was ridiculing the original. And they had used a lot of the music from the original sound recording. They had Roy Orbison's voice. On, on the Two Life Crew version. So they, they used a fairly substantial amount of the actual music and sound from the original recording, and the court said that was highly transformative. Now, one of the key things to remember is don't go overboard. Again, um, you use some of it, but uh, if you start taking minutes and minutes of the song, you may have 
gone outside the bounds of reasonableness. That is, did you reasonably need that much to say what you wanted to say? You always have to remember that third factor, keep it reasonable. If you're doing a true parody and you're keeping the amount reasonable, again, you're probably going to be in pretty good shape under the fair use analysis. If I'm doing a news program where I report on a story, am I allowed to use video footage or photos pertaining to that story? Well, that, that can be a little tricky. Um, if you focus in on the question of transformation, if you're doing a, a story about, say, the earthquake in Japan, and you use news footage that was covering the earthquake in Japan, you're probably using that footage for pretty much the same purpose for which it was originally created. So it's unclear what the transformation is. Now, on the other hand, uh, if you find footage of the subject you're talking about, I don't know, maybe you're doing a story about the nuclear industry in America and you happen to find photographs of nuclear reactors on somebody's website for whatever reason, um, that is the subject matter of your story and perhaps you're entitled to more latitude to use that in relation to the news story. Um, keep in mind that news reporting is one of the things mentioned specifically in the fair use statute, which causes most people to say, well, everything, not, everything being equal, the fact you're doing it for news reporting probably gets you a little more latitude. So there, there have been situations where people have been permitted to use entire photographs because the photographs uh, were themselves the subject or connected to the subject of the news story. But you have, to, you have to always keep in mind, is my purpose different than the original purpose for the work? And if you're just taking um, somebody else's news story and turning into your own news story, the transformation question could turn out to be a little dicey. And on top of that, uh, you may worry that you're harming the market for the original too much because, of course, maybe your news story substitutes for the news story from which you borrowed. So um, depending on what you're using and how you're using it, that can be a shaky situation. Can you make money off of a movie you produce that was inspired by another book or film as long as the story is unique, like a fan film that exists in the same universe but with original characters and storyline? Is this fair use? Ooh, boy, that's a tricky one. Um, so you're always free to be inspired by another work. Uh, ideas are never protected. So, you know, notwithstanding the fact somebody made Star Wars and Battlestar Galactica, I can still make a drama set in space about good versus evil. Which we, the, the, the point at which you have to worry is when you use more specific pieces from a film or another work. If you're using the characters in a completely new storyline, that's a particularly tricky question. Um, most people consider that a derivative work of the original film. Characters get some specific protection apart from the story they're in. That protection, however, is, has been largely defined based on their appearance. So if you're talking about a written work, you lose that aspect of it. But Nonetheless, characters in a drama, um, forget about their appearance, their, their attributes, what they do, who they are, what made them what they are, are protectable pieces of expression from the original. And if you use too many of those things, you will probably end up infringing. Um, the, the fair use question becomes tough uh, in some respects. On one hand, you can say, well, my story is really transformative. I'm taking these characters and putting them into a brand new drama. And it is transformative in that way, but the, the, the counterpoint to that is, well, but that's just the point. The copyright owner takes these characters and puts them into new stories, and so that's really the original purpose for which the characters were created, to place them into stories like this. Highly dramatic work, second factor cuts a bit against you. Um, hard to figure out without more specifics how the third factor works, that is how much you're using, whether it's reasonable. The tough part is the impact on the market for the original. Um, most people consider sequels to be derivative works. I think there are some wrinkles there that uh, courts haven't really grappled with yet. But none of this, none of this provides any easy answer. Um, it, in large part, comes down to, I think, what copyright owners are going to tolerate. Some of them have been really aggressive in going after um, fan works. Others have been much more permissive, probably on the theory this is only going to make the original more popular. So this is one of those situations where the specifics are really, really important. There's no easy 
one size fits all answer. And you have to think really carefully about uh, the enforcement question. That is, are you borrowing material from somebody who's litigious, who is aggressive and going after people? So if you're going to do something like that, that's a place where I would say, go talk to somebody about the specifics of, of what you want to do. Maybe it's us, maybe it's others, but that's something you want to look at pretty closely. And you should be especially mindful of the fact that the reason some of the copyright owners who have been very aggressive about pursuing these things give is, hey, it's one thing if you want to do this just for fun, out of love of the film or the book or whatever. If you're doing it on a nonprofit basis, that's one thing. But when you start trying to go make money on that, that's where I draw the line. And so doing it uh, as a commercial venture, um, again, part of the fair use analysis, not just positive, but it can be very important when it comes to the decision uh, on the part of the copyright owner whether to go after you or not. Can I perform a copyrighted song in a YouTube video? Can I teach how to play it? Can I show guitar tablature or music notation? That's another tricky one. As far as uh, simply performing it, the transformation argument may not be as strong as it would be in other cases, in situations where maybe you have something to say about the song, um, whether you're performing it for some different purpose, maybe it's parody, maybe you think the song says something else about the world, typically called satire. Teaching it, on the other hand, probably presents a stronger case for fair use. Again, teaching is one of the things that's called out specifically in the preamble of the statute, and it's one of the things most people agree fair use protects fairly strongly. So if you're using a song to teach somebody how to play the guitar, or even to play that song, that starts to sound like something pretty transformative because the original song is presumably um, to entertain and enjoy, uh, whereas the purpose of the video now is to teach somebody how to play the music. So that starts to sound pretty transformative. Presumably you're not doing it for money. The original work is probably pretty creative, if not very creative, so maybe that one cuts a bit against you. And the third factor, well, you know, how do you teach somebody to play a song without using the whole song? You can imagine a pretty good case for saying a large part of the song is reasonable in relation to the purpose for which I'm using it. Then finally, on the, on the, on the, on the market impact, well, I don't think anybody is going to substitute that instructional video for the original song. Um, maybe the copyright owner says, gosh, that's a derivative work that I'm entitled to do. If anybody's going to teach anybody how to make that song, it's going to be me. Uh, that's, that falls a little flat for me. So, the, the, you know, the teaching, I think, um, could, could, could be a pretty strong case for fair use. Again, probably depends on some details. You could do it in ways that are stronger. You could do it in ways that are weaker. Um, no one size fits all answer, but I, I think that presents a much stronger case than just performing the song. What kind of categories fall under fair use? Review, education? What if the clip you're using doesn't fit into one of them? Can it still be fair use? There are no magic categories to fair use. The statute identifies uses it looks favorably upon, so it specifically notes uses to comment, criticize, report, research, teach, but by no means is that the extent of the categories of uses that fair use protects. It's flexible by design. You always have to apply the four factors, and it's only the four factors that can give you an answer in any particular situation. So if the clip you're using or the reason you want to use it or whatever it is you're doing doesn't fit into any of those categories, that is not the end of the story by any stretch. You go through the four-factor analysis and that's what's going to tell you whether your use is going to be protected or not, or likely protected. And in fact, that's really the point of fair use. Um, one of its great strengths is it's not constrained to predefined categories. It's flexible enough to be applied to brand new things that nobody ever thought of when the statute was drafted. If I want to make software video tutorials and I record my screen with software being shown throughout the video, does that qualify as fair use? Pretty likely. I assume you mean screenshots of the software as you use it, accompanied by the narrative explaining and teaching the, the viewer how to use it. And if, if that's what you're talking about, then yeah, I, I think that's probably going to be a, a pretty strong fair use case. It's very transformative relative to the purpose of the software. You're teaching somebody how to use the software, not providing any substitute for the software product. Uh, maybe you're doing it for profit, maybe you're not, not fatal if you are. 
The second factor, boy, I don't know exactly how that works. Um, it's not exactly creative, uh, although it's not exactly factual either. So maybe it's a wash, maybe it cuts against you. But the third factor probably works in your favor. You're certainly not using the whole copyrighted computer program. You're using only isolated uh, snippets of what shows up on the screen at any given time. And most fundamentally, you are probably not doing any plausible harm to the market for the original. Nobody's going to buy your video instead of buying the software. If anything, uh, people are, are only going to watch your video once they've bought the software, because only then are they going to want to know how to use it. And I don't think a software maker would get very far by saying they should be the only people who are allowed to teach folks how to use their software. So again, always just depends on specifics, but that's probably one that presents a pretty strong fair use case. If I use two to three seconds of a video for a mashup, but give credit to that video owner, is it fair use? Well, giving credit's not a magic bullet. It doesn't solve the problem. You always got to go through the four-factor analysis. But mashups in general present really interesting fair use questions. Um, looking at transformation, a lot of them are just fantastically creative. Some great examples on YouTube. Um, Broke Back to the Future, 10 Things I Hate About Commandments, the, the Bush and Blair Endless Love video. Those things are fantastically creative and, and, and mashing those things together obviously has a, a, a much different meaning and expression than either one of the originals does. So I, I think most of them are pretty transformative. Most people do them on a nonprofit basis. Now the work you're using is obviously very creative for the most part. So that probably cuts against you. Um, how much you're using, uh, you know, typically people don't have the attention span to watch mashups that are more than a few minutes long. And you know, if you're talking about mashups from uh, feature films, you're using a fairly small part and pretty reasonable in relation to the, the, the parody or satire or whatever creative purpose you're using it for. And really, uh, you know, the, the, the idea that they're going to do much harm to the markets for the original is, is, is pretty far-fetched. Maybe there's concern about derivative markets, but they're, they're usually so fun and silly that it's, it's not something you would expect the copyright owner to go do. So it's, it's, it's hard to imagine how you're doing too much damage to the market for the original. None, nonetheless, you're talking about valuable properties in a lot of cases. And so, again, some copyright owners have proven to be more aggressive about going after these things than others, and that's something you probably ought to consider. But in, in, in general, um, the, the mashup genre is one that I think is fantastically creative. Um, it's, it's one of the, the, the neatest things, I think, that's grown out of YouTube and the, and the, and the Internet. So I would, I would encourage people to do it, but think carefully. And when you come into a specific situation where you've got something that you've done and, and, and you have concerns about it, then you can rely um, and call on people like us or others to give you some specific advice about it and make sure you're comfortable doing what you're doing. Can I review a movie based on one element in that movie and include clips from that movie in my review without violating copyright? Keep in mind, I am essentially promoting that movie and I am not making any money from the review. Yes, using copyrighted material in a review is a classic case of fair use. And so using a clip or um, portions of the copyrighted material in order to present your review of, the, of a film that is something that is very likely to be found a fair use. You're using it for a very different purpose than the original. You're commenting on it, and you might be criticizing it. So in answer to your, the second part of the question, it doesn't even matter if you are promoting the film. You could be criticizing the film and saying that it's terrible and using clips to support that argument, and that would still be a fair use. Also, um, and if, if you were doing the review for a commercial purpose and were making money, that also wouldn't be a determining factor. So reviews and using the copyrighted material to support that review, that's a classic uh, use that is often considered a fair use. Are there any cases in which posting the uncut entirety of another's content could be considered fair use? For instance, if commentary is located in the description or annotation fields and not on the video itself? Yes, there are times when you can use the entire video of um, an entire piece of copyrighted content and repost it. For example, if you are posting a video, and a particularly short video, and you want to spur discussion, and that discussion is going to be held in the comments or uh, the rest of the website, those are legitimate uses of an entire video. Other examples that people use entire uh, videos are for 
archiving video content or to memorialize something to make sure that it's preserved. So for example, if you have a politician who speaks out of turn or makes some kind of blunder and you want to make sure that that's uh, captured and preserved, you could post that and um, you might not be in violation of copyright. You want to be careful that you're not using full um, videos, for example, a music video and just reposting that video and saying you want everybody to talk about it. That's not going, that's going to put you in a different position. Is there a way to give credit to the original owners of the content in a mashup, similar to how you make a works cited page for an academic paper? So giving credit isn't necessary, it isn't required by the law, but it's often a good idea. And one way that you can do credit with a video is to have the credits scroll at the end of the video the same way you see at the end of movies. Now, this isn't going to protect you from a lawsuit, but people are often most concerned with being credited and having an acknowledgement that the work that you're using includes work of theirs. And so it often helps um, to include credit. And if you can do it, it's a good idea. Can a person use actual clips from a movie, i.e. Star Wars, if he green screens himself into them to change them for comedic purposes? Using the video clips and inserting yourself in to the, into the movie clips as posed in this question, that would be a transformative use. You're using it for a different purpose than was the original, and you're obviously not substituting for the original movie. Presumably people aren't going to watch your movie instead of watching the original Star Wars. And so on the first factor, whether it's transformative and, or not, that seems uh, like a pretty creative use. Um, in addition, using it in a comedic way, you might be making a commentary about the original or criticizing the original as well, which is another argument that will bolster your fair use defense. As to um, the, the other factors, now obviously it depends how much of the original are you using, um, whether you could do that, you, you know, whether you could do this for the entire movie or not is probably um, probably less likely, um, and how much of the original you are using is going to be an important part of that. Um, obviously, the second factor, Star Wars, is a very creative work, but um, that may be a wash or may weigh slightly against using it as a fair use. But the more transformative it is, the different you know you're. You're making it different by inserting yourself into the movie and then adding lines and adding a new and different purpose. Um, those are the important things. As for the fourth factor, the effect on the market, that probably isn't much effect uh, on the original market for, for your uh, movie. It certainly isn't a substitute because it is a transformative use. Using the original actual movie clips in this way could very well be a fair use. Obviously, it depends on the circumstances of how you used it, but there are there's a good chance that you could do this uh, without being an infringer. I've heard and seen content owners complaining about content that they don't own. Is there a way to take legal action or at least right those wrongs? So if you receive a takedown and you know that it falsely represents who owns the copyright and the content of your video, you can sue the person for sending that false takedown and recover the costs of responding to it. I hope this discussion has been useful to you. Please do keep in mind that it's only a general discussion. The only way to assess fair use is to look specifically at the content and analyze it in its final form. The discussion we've had today, I hope, provides general guidance, but it shouldn't be used as a substitute for specific legal advice about something you create. If you want to post something and you're worried about it, you should talk to a lawyer. The things we've talked about today can't give you answers and are not the sort of things you should rely on in deciding whether to post something or not. Finally, a word about fair use itself. It's not a dusty, dark, little exception to copyright rules. It's a fundamental part of the copyright bargain. It is a thing that protects your right to express yourself and create new things from the world around you. My friend and colleague Peter Yazzie once said, fair use is like a muscle. If you don't exercise it, it'll wither. So use it, exercise it, go out there and keep creating fantastic new things.